Hey everybody, this is Chelsea Schaefer and Caitlin Dustoff, and this is The Score, the official podcast of the sport of team roping. This is the Team Roping Journal's semi-weekly podcast, highlighting the team roping industry's top talents and influencers through stories that inspire and connect ropers. We sit down with ropers from the professional ranks, as well as industry icons and producers to delve into topics that make the team roping world tick. This is season two. It will feature even deeper interviews, storytelling, and issue-based coverage, and we are so excited you're here. Hey everybody, welcome to The Score. This is Chelsea Schaefer. And Caitlin Gustav. And today, our guest is Drew Horner. Yes. That's exciting. Interesting interview. Different. It's way different. Way uh-huh. different. Um, for folks who don't know or remember Drew Horner, which surely you remember Drew Horner, but he is a former BFI champ. He roped with Buddy Hawkins at the NFR in 2013. And yeah, 2014 was the year that he won the BFI with Buddy. 2015, he won the Ram National Circuit mm-hmm. Finals. And since then, he has slowly transitioned out of professional rodeo. But I've always hit it off with Drew. I'm so glad. He's so savvy. Uh, if you guys follow Drew on social media, he's verified. He has a little blue check mark after his oh, name. Yeah, because yeah, he is Always on the Insta, always on the Facebook. Well, maybe not even as much on the Facebook. He's very into Instagram. He's so motivational. He works in corporate America now for his family's business, Premier Designs. It's a jewelry company, and he travels all over the world. He works really hard for his family's company. And it's kind of, like I said, a little less traditional of a team roping interview because we talk a little bit about life after team roping. Mm-hmm. which is a very real thing. Drew Drew's fixing to get married. He's kind of starting a life outside of rodeo. He's really involved in his church, and he talks a lot about how that has played a part in his roping career and his his life after rodeo. So, I mean, I love Drew, and I hope we get to see him back in professional rodeo, at the very least back at the World Series USDRC level roping. But if not... I hope we get to keep getting wisdom from Drew. And you can follow him, like I said, on social media. And I really hope you enjoy this episode. So, Drew, Mm -hmm. welcome to The Score. Have you been listening? Do you pay attention to team roping at all that you listen to my podcast anymore? Uh, Yeah, no, I've paid attention to rodeo for sure. I I, uh, I miss the sport so much. And so getting the kind of two guys. Yeah, I do. I miss it a lot. The... uh, so I pay attention. I've listened to a few episodes of The Score, and, and so I'm actually pretty amped. You actually asked me to be a part of it, which I was well, shocked. I am constantly fascinated by people who st- who are able to like detox from rodeo, and you went through a withdrawal, and now you mm-hmm. are like you're out. I can't. It always amazes me because cowboys are such addicts. How you can like cut the cord and get out of rodeo, and so I mean, there's so much I want to talk to you about. But yeah. I guess first, you how long have you been kind of – you sold your last head horse last year, right? Yeah, yeah, I did. I, well, I sold the last one that still is usable, I guess, or still like able to mm-hmm. – young, young enough to go. So I sold, I sold Rango to Charlie Crawford, which he's the horse that I won the Bob Feist on. He's, he was phenomenal and the uh, outstanding horse. I got him from Bobby Moat, who came from Trevor Brazil from there. So just a great horse. Mm-hmm. Um, I sold my horse Slick. Which was probably those two are the probably the hardest sells I've ever had mm-hmm. um, because Slick was the horse I actually learned how to rope on, mm-hmm. uh, and so I got him about maybe I think I got him about five or six months after I started roping when I was fifteen years old. Yeah, um, and so like I was I was just getting to the point where I'm like you know you're past using a breakaway rope, and so I was kind of like he's like the first horse I ever turned steers on pretty much, and then I rode him at the National Finals Rodeo uh, ten years later or you know eight years later or something. Mm-hmm. And so selling him to Luke Branquino was uh, pretty like I actually so I hadn't I hadn't rode horses much since I got off of road since I was done team repping, uh, but I made an effort to go get on him and spend like four hours in the afternoon just riding him around the pasture. I roped the machine on him, roped that Smarty on him, and just spent some time with him. It took it's just funny. I know it's this is crazy. I'm a guy, you know, whatever. But I like I took selfies with him just to kind of have him. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's just, it was it was hard to sell him. But the coolest part about it is I knew he was going to a good home. Mm-hmm. Uh, I knew he was going to you know Luke out there in California, who's rodeo cowboy, takes care of horses and his animals. Is Luke roping on him? Is he for his kids? So he ropes on him a little bit. He got him for 
in his kids. So is that he sent me a video on him like a month later of his son turning his first deer ever on slick. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. So it was cool. And I, I met his family to, I, I knew his wife. I've never met his kids or anything, but I, he, he, I saw him in Vegas this past year at the finals and, uh, I met his kid and he's like, Hey, this is the guy that owned your horse. They rode him at the finals out here. And it was just kind of a fun moment for me mm-hmm. uh, just to kind of be like, Hey, I learned how to rope on that horse, rode him through my entire career. He was kind of my ace in the hole. Uh, and then now to see his son learning how to rope on the horse that kind of made me who I was in rodeo, which was, was pretty cool. So did you also have one of Drigger's good ones? I bought that horse from him. Yeah. The, uh, I think he's riding him a lot lately. Um, Dre, he uh, did Drigger call him Dre yeah. and you called him something else. <laughs> I called him Tex. I didn't like the name Dre. <laughs> <laughs> that horse is so definitively Dre though. But <laughs> I know, I know. I had him, I had him for I had him, I bought him. I had him for a year or so, year and a half. I won Fort Worth on him, which is a great horse. That horse mm-hmm. is really good. And, and it has that he, that horse is a very unique style. He fit me well. Like honestly, mm-hmm. I really liked him. Uh, I wasn't always like a hundred percent on him. Like I just wasn't, it wasn't like I was riding slick. who was my ace and mm-hmm. hole or kind of that Rango feel for me or in my other horse goose, which was kind of a bigger sorrel that I had, but like, honestly, he gave you a chance every time. Like the horse is so good. He's not crazy, crazy fast, but he's fast enough. He's honest. Um, he faced really well. Uh, but yeah, I think, I don't know if Driggers is still riding him a lot now or not. I just saw Driggers. Had- yeah. He rode him at the finals, not this past year, but the year before. Mm-hmm. And then yeah, I think he that. might've even had him in Vegas. I don't this year. I'm not sure. Yeah. That horse was cool. Yeah. Yeah, he he's got to be older now. I think he's like 23. I don't have any idea. Uh, yeah. I don't know how old that horse is, but he's great. I mean, I'm sure yeah. he's still good. So now, talk about. So you got into rodeo late. You you were kind of a late comer to the whole game. Tell me mm-hmm. how that kind of evolution happened. So I, it's funny. Somebody asked me yesterday. No joke. Yesterday they go. They said, uh, "City boy turned rodeo cowboy." And I just laughed. And this was a city person asking this. And I was like, yeah, that's exactly what happened. I, uh, I grew up in, in Plano, Texas, which is the suburb of, of Dallas, Texas. And I was just, I was playing hockey and baseball and I was 15 years old. And I was, my dad had, had roped for fun. Uh, he had some property and some horses. I, I never really was around it at all, but he put me to work out there a little bit uh, occasionally. And I was kind of at the age where I was like, all right, I need, I need work now anyway. Uh, and so he puts me at the back end of the arena, which I have never worked with animals, never worked with like large animals or cattle or anything in my life ever. Uh, and so if you can imagine a, a kid at the strip and shoot, you know, not and from, you know, playing hockey and baseball, taking ropes off steers, uh, and then me being kind of ADD and just always wanting to do something, I got bored waiting on them in between runs. And so I back the steers out of the strip and shoot, just push them out as best I could. I had no idea. <laughs> you know, I'm like sitting there trying not to get hurt and smash my hands or something, but just having fun with it. And my dad's calling me right now. Sorry. You're good. <laughs> but, uh, so I'm back and steers out of the strip and shoot. And then I, I would chase them around. I figured out, I learned that they, they're kind of, they're trained. They essentially go to the strip and shoot. Mm-hmm. And so I would chase them out a little bit, you know, about 20 feet as much as I could. And they would turn back and run at me. <laughs> and I'd let them run by me and I'd try to try to rope them as they ran by. <laughs> and I know, I know it's really funny. I I'm trying not to get hooked first of all, cause these suckers are coming at me and I don't know what I'm doing. And then secondly, I'm swinging a rope that I'm probably going to get my hand caught in it. If I caught one and drug down, <laughs> stuck down the arena. <laughs> and so my dad comes down there and he, they're laughing at me and they, they showed me how to hold a rope, show me how to swing it and stuff. And then, uh, next day I'm out there and I'm, he takes me, I'm, I'm learning how to saddle a horse. So I'm saddling horses, doing all these things and, and brushing and grooming the day after that and feeding. And, you know, the, the next week I'm more, I'm, I'm riding horses and warming horses up and things. And I always say this, it's funny because I realize now looking back on it, my dad was teaching me to do everything that he didn't want to do. Mm-hmm. You know, he's teaching me how to work the shoots. He's teaching me how to <laughs> feed horses, how to groom horses, how to saddle horses. And I'm ultimately I'm riding horses, but I'm warming his horses up. Every That's like time. the trick to parenthood. My yeah. kid's so into putting socks into drawers right now. It's like the same thing. Yeah, it's funny. Yeah, you're using them fold. Hey, fold this way. This is great. Keep doing yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. That's funny. So anyway, I, I'm glad I did. I'm super thankful that I, I got to do all that and, and then, you know, got to pursue a career in rodeo because of it. And it was such a blessing and learned a lot. I think God did a lot in my life through that, so. Did you find yourself easily accepted into, I mean, that, that hmm. area, the, the cowboy scene there is pretty tight knit and you've got to have a yeah. lot of cred to kind of <laughs> tell me how that went. I, I think I faced a lot of, so to my face, I, I didn't see someone's uh, tell me a lot of things a lot of time, 
you know, I had a lot of people say that I didn't deserve to be there. I had a lot of people say uh, some things that like, like just to essentially straight up, like he's not a real cowboy, which I, honestly, to their credit, I'm, I'm not a real cowboy. I never claimed to be a real cowboy. If I'm back in the box and I beat you, that's all I cared about. And so I think, uh, I think when I, there was a time, I remember times when I was younger, when uh, I didn't know everybody because everybody, you know, they all knew each other in rodeo. I'm 15 coming out of nowhere. So I'm 17 years old at this time, you know, jackpots in North Texas, trying to just make friends, get to know everybody. But it wasn't until I started winning when people really started acknowledging <laughs> me. And so I think that was the biggest, that's, I think I never really saw it. Like I just never cared. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it wasn't hard for me. Like I'm, I'm just a people person. So I want to get to know everybody. But when it came down to competing and getting pardons, it took a while. Wow, I mean, uh, great partners, you know. Uh, yeah, uh, and, and me and Buddy, like if, if I think <laughs> I think I lucked into getting Buddy. Uh, you know, he, <laughs> you guys are like and, the perfect pair. That lucked into it doesn't even cut it as far as describing that. <laughs> yeah, thanks. It, it's fun. I uh, he was my favorite partner I ever wrote with. I mean, I wrote with a lot of guys, um, but as far as partnerships and and just relationship wise, he was my my favorite one. He, just side note: if you look at my stats, like our resume together mm-hmm. for anybody. He was the only guy that I won anything, any major title with at any level. Mm-hmm. So like amateur Rodeon, I, he's the only guy I ever made the finals with. Circuit Rodeon, I made finals with other guys, but he's the only guy I ever won finals with. Mm-hmm. You know, major jackpots, he's the only guy I won major jackpots with. And major rodeos, he's the only guy I won major rodeos with. I made the finals with him. So every title I have, like major title, is with him. Yeah, his name is next to yours. What was the yeah. – I mean – Knowing you both, I, I can say so many fun things about you guys that, that I see that make your personalities fit. But I mean, what did, what was the chemistry in the arena? Gosh, um, I think uh, we so chemistry in the arena. I think came from outside the mm-hmm. arena. It was more of a. It wasn't just practice for us. Like we, you know, yeah, we made we made thousands and thousands of runs together before we even like before we even thought about getting in these big rodeo, like before we would go somewhere, we've made that run thousands of times, which every, you know, every professional header and team mm-hmm. rep or team says that. Right. Um, but I think for us, it was more of a, the commitment to the same uh, perspective on what we were doing. Uh, and so like we would, we desired to be not only just good at what we did, but to be a team in what we were doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if I missed like, the, the, our relationship was probably, it was more important to me and him both so that we would come, I mean, in, in rodeo and team rep and especially you don't only, you don't only just work together, you live together. It's more than a marriage almost uh, yeah because like you're going to work together. And then if you miss, if somebody messes up at work, you know, a hundred yards later, you're both at the same spot finishing your job and you're both getting in the same room. Like you're both, it's mm-hmm. just, a, it's, so you have to live with this person and so we both valued um, each other more than we did in team roping. So I think the chemistry didn't come from the fact that, okay, yeah, we're going to rope good together and we're going to win. It was more in the fact that um, there was grace and forgiveness and trust and the fact that if I screwed up, he's not going to just butcher me and mm-hmm. call me he's behind my back and screw me up. He's going to try to help me get better. Uh, and so I think there was a trust in that, uh, that I could back in the box knowing, clear-minded, that whatever happens here, you know, it, it matters to winning, but it doesn't matter to the ultimate long-term perspective of what we viewed our partnership to be. So I think that's where the chemistry really came from was just uh, a support in each other's mission of trying yeah. to get in the world and, and knowing that we're both putting full effort into it. But then when you guys made the finals, the year you all made the finals, mm-hmm. didn't you buddy with Clay Tryon and Jake Corkill? <laughs> yeah, that was Which- that was a- <laughs> it's the happen. craziest combination of I, I have the utmost respect for Clay and Jade, and I, I love them as human beings. But just pairing you and Buddy with Clay and Jade, yeah, is that was it was personalities <laughs> totally, totally. <laughs> uh, like you know, me and Buddy miss. It's one thing. It's like all right, cool. You know, we're, we're pissed, so we get mad about it. But mm-hmm. I try not to like show that in any way. We're like, I want to show it. It's okay to show it. It's okay to throw your hat and stuff. Um, but when you know Clay try and misses, he throws his rope in the middle of the arena. You know, and you're like, <laughs> and he's a three time world champ, and he'll say it. But he throws. Yeah. it. I tell him his face. I always told him like, hey, quit whining, bro. You're world champ, and come back to the trailer. You know, but like uh, <laughs> when it's just funny. Like I, I roped with, so I roped with Justin cop that 2012, uh, mm-hmm. 2012, the year before I got back with buddy. And, uh, that was the year I first started buddy on the play. 
Mm-hmm. And and nobody buddied with Clay. Like he, I don't think so. Like he before then, like he was kind of on his own. Him and Jade were just on their own. I just asked him, like, "Hey, bro, can I just tag along with you? Like, you're the world champ. You're the best guy in the world at this time. You know, I want to just learn and, and be your friend and do what you do. Essentially, mm-hmm. I was like, I'll be out of the way. Just let me follow you. And he was cool with that. And so when I came back with Buddy, it was like we were just going to do that again. And then we got to Buddy, and you know, that year was the year. I think they won a world title that year too. Mm-hmm. And they'd won maybe three in a row at that point or something. And that's the best team in the world. And so you're around Clay who is, you know, best hair in the world, family established in sport of rodeo. And then you got Jade Corkill, who's, uh, I got a young family at the time and, you know, world champ and best feel in the world. And just the network of what they had being around those guys was phenomenal and is outstanding. Uh, I just can't tell you how much of a, uh, how, how good those guys were to me and buddy, uh, despite the fact that we were complete opposites in every <laughs> way, I think. Yeah. Uh, like I think, but by osmosis, you would just learn so much about winning and, and what those two go through to to win yeah. the way they do is impressive. So I, I anyway, yeah. I just have always thought like I picture plane rides or truck rides with you two in the back seat and Clay and Jade in the front <laughs> seat and trying to like I would love to have been a fly on the wall for some. Oh of my those gosh, trips. it's so funny. You know, you know what's funny is that so I, Clay always made fun of my driving like always, uh-huh. like all the time, and I was fine with it because every time he made fun of me driving. He would take over the driver's seat and then mock me. And I'm like, that, I would just act like I cared, right? And I'm like, no, but he's driving for the next 13 hours. And I'm like, world champs driving me, valeting me around the rodeos is what I tell them. So I thought it was pretty funny. That is funny. That's yeah. hilarious. Yeah. Those, those, that's, that, those were the days, huh? Yeah, it so, was great. So then 2014, you win the BFI, which nobody just saw that, but that was perfect timing because I think you just drank out of a BFI Yeti. I actually did. Just now. Oh, I did. Did you see that? You just as, as I said that I'm watching you on this on this video broadcast <laughs> that we're doing right now and you it was like you were on a perfect product placement. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. That was completely unintentional. That's from that's actually the last year 2016. It was the last year I competed at the BFI. Yeah, so. That's awesome. So what is um I mean the BFI was a dream come true obviously. Making mm-hmm. NFR was a dream come true. Uh, the BFI was a dream come true. Uh, yeah. Tell me about that day uh, around winning the face. What, what was going on that day? I think oh my gosh. It was honestly looking at that day it was just like any other roping. Like mm-hmm. it was just the, the initial day morning, right? No big deal. Go check in, get entered. Okay, it's the BFI, you could win X amount of dollars a day or whatever. It's great. But I think uh going through silent horse and you're warming up and doing your thing. And, and there's obviously a little bit higher level of, of pressure, but it really isn't that much. It's the same as any other jackpot for us, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and we just kind of came off the finals. We're doing pretty bad that year on Well, we were the top 20 or so at that point, maybe. I think the day was awesome though, because uh, when I look at that, it, everything, you know, we roped good. We didn't, we rope, mm-hmm. we actually, we roped pretty good. Like it, you have to rope good to win that roping, but we didn't rope the best. We didn't rope great. Well, yeah, we did because we won, but we didn't rope just <laughs> great, right? Yeah. So by the third round, there was, it was Clay and Jade and then Trevor and Travis Graves. Mm-hmm. Uh, and those two teams were going back and forth, first and second, from third, fourth, and fifth round. Uh, and we were the only team that was close to them. Like, well, mm-hmm. not the only, but we were third place the whole time. Like we didn't mm-hmm. go from third to fourth. By the third round, we were in third the whole time. And so I would rope. Uh, and then I would go watch the rope and I'd watch these other teams go the whole time. Or I'd watch the starter trying to figure out what's going on, you know, and I'm sitting in the stands and I, I, or I go down and I think I see I'm behind the box and I'm watching the start and Trevor goes down and they're like winning the average right now to him and TG or winning the average by, you know, half a second with Clay and Jade, they're on their tail. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Trevor ropes her front leg, uh, you know, and you're like, okay, all right, well, there's one team that's out now I'm second I'm sitting here thinking, all right, Clay and Jade are going down. You know, no big deal. And so at this point, I go back and I'm watching in the stands um, with my dad about 50 yard line over there by the announcer stand. And I think Clay turns him and Jay, Jay just Jay fought, just missed him. Uh, mm-hmm. was, you know, no world champ. I'm not just gonna. He's one of the best hitters in the world. So, uh, but he missed him, and and he's my friend too. And so mm-hmm. I'm looking at this. I'm looking at this two ways. I don't initially respond right, um, like immediately. I look at this like, dang it, like Jay just missed to be high call. And then about two seconds after that, I leaned over to my dad and his friend, Robert Till. And I go, well, I'm high call at the BFI. And so mm-hmm. I just left, got up, just walked out and went and sat in the warm-up arena, just kind of waiting to kind of see what was going to, what was going to come to. And I knew I was high call. And then, you know, it's like a 30 minute period there because they have a whole intermission, all this kind of stuff. And I'm just trying not to get my nerves too hyped up, you know, at this <laughs> point. And so, uh, we go in and, um, we're walking and watching the short round, watching the short round. And I think we had to be, 
think we had to be like nine two or something to win their open. Uh, I think Aaron Synergy uh, spun a steer and all. I think it was him and Ryan Motes, maybe one second. Yeah, it year. was. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they went out and made a good run, just eight, you know, nothing special. I think it was, I don't, I don't know how fast they were, but I remember being like, okay, we got a nine two. And I, I recognized the steer a little bit. Kevin Daniel was there at the time too. I recognized the steer a little bit, but one of the worst things for me you could ever do is overanalyze anything. Uh, and, and buddy is one of the most analytical guys you'll ever meet. Yeah, for <laughs> and sure. so, uh, a lot of times at Ropens as we matured and as we got better, we didn't even, we never even really talked that much throughout the Ropens. We just kind of knew our game. We talked about it all before, but during the Ropens, we knew our game plan. We knew what we were going to do. We both knew what we wanted to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so we both were going to do the best we could to do that. And so we hadn't even talked the whole day, I don't think. And so back in the box, I recognize a steer. I'm like, all right, whatever. Don't care. Just go rope. Well, Buddy recognizes the steer, and on his mind, he could probably tell about it more. He's thinking, oh, this is a steer that Big A just waved it off of in the fifth round. I don't even know why he's in the short round. All this kind of stuff <laughs> is going through his mind. And I'm like, just blocked out, just going to go do my job. And Kevin Daniels, the same way as Buddy is, and he's sitting right next to the box, and he goes, hey, you know this steer? And I'm just ignoring him. I'm like, don't talk to me. Don't say nothing. Like, don't say nothing. He's just trying to help. He's fine. But he's just talking to me. And he just slaps me on the legs. Hey, good luck. You know, I'm walking the box. And then we back in and get a great start or just a good start there and go down. Mm-hmm. And we, we were like 8 2. And when we were 8 2, uh, I think, um, you know, I turn and face, look at the clock. And I, I never, I always wanted to uh, enjoy the moments as best I could, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's something I started praying for actually about halfway through my year in 2013, that I would enjoy moments that when they mm-hmm. come, that I see if we win something. Mm-hmm. If we, if we're, I want, and so when we, uh, when we turn face eight, two on a, on a pretty crappy steer, really, uh, I immediately threw my hat. I was like, yes. <laughs> yeah. Right? And, uh, I wanted to take in the moment as much as possible with the guy that I, not only the fact that we just wanted the FI, but I won it with buddy Hawkins, uh, yeah. who is a best friend of mine. Uh, is a stud, a dude that's, you know, rocked my world, changed my life, uh, made mm-hmm. me a better man. And so I think thinking throughout that whole day of just like processing, just like any other road thing, and then going and seeing two of the best teams in the world, you know, Trevor just re- quote retires from rodeo here this year, seeing a guy that's, you know, a guy that I've looked up to that I've bought probably, I bought three horses from over my career, Trevor, mm-hmm. you know, a guy like that. And then Clay trying and Jay Corco, our buddy team at the time, you know, uh, mm-hmm. some of the guys that I was going back to Jay's house that night, you know, and see them mess and go out and then let's go win kind of a really high and low moment of everything. Yeah. Um, but then winning it and seeing, looking across the backside and seeing, seeing Boudreaux uh, <laughs> being just kind of his little silent, you know, act like I've been here before, kind of smile, <laughs> kind of feel he does, you know, and me just throwing a hat and loving it, looking at him and just being like, bro, we just won the Bob Feist Invitational. I mean, it's yeah. like, you know, such a God thing. and It's unbelievable to see kind of what happens there. So the feelings were, pretty focused and very, very high, but also kind of some kind of influx of trying to maintain chill because you'd see your friends mess out and and things like that as well. So it was was a good day. And now you made a few comments. You said it it was a God thing. And then what has, I know faith has been such an important part of your roping career and your whole life beyond that. You you said something interesting that, that you prayed to enjoy the moment. What were some of the other really important things that you prayed for throughout your roping career? Oh gosh. Integrity in roping uh, mm-hmm. was a big one for me um, that I prayed for that I would always do a well job in that because in, in team roping, it's easy to get a reputation of just going from one partner to the next mm-hmm. uh, and also how you handle that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there was a lot of guys in roping that would get the reputation of uh, just, Hey, I'm going to the, I'm roping with him next week, uh, mm-hmm. which that's you know not cool. So I think integrity was huge for me, but my relationship with Christ uh, mm-hmm. was what, like, as far as the big thing, um, there was a lot of time downtime in rodeo that, um, you know, for me, it's like you're either going to practice or you're going to drive or you're going to be sitting somewhere and then mm-hmm. competing. Like there's just a lot of downtime in, in rodeo and in team up. And, and so for me, I filled that time with uh, two things. I filled it with one, going to the gym, which is, mm-hmm. I love going to the gym. But two, mainly I would go to just coffee shops and Buddy did this with me. And we would just sit there and read for hours. Like I would mm-hmm. put headphones on and just, I would just read the Bible. Like that's all I did. And so what I, what, at that time, I'm you know, 22 at the time. And I think what happened was I, I started reading Old Testament stories and I would see uh, like stories of David uh, and Daniel. Uh, if you haven't ever read them, or if somebody hasn't read them out there, it's like you, I'm reading a story about King David, who was the best king of Israel at the time, which this is history here. You can look at mm-hmm. it. Um, and I'm reading about this man who was um, a faithful man, like and considered a man after God's own heart. 
and I would see uh, him be an excellent leader. Essentially what I want to do now is like be a leader in our company. I want to be a, a chief servant off a chief executive officer of the company, a president of the company. I want to lead people well. So I'm looking at a man who led a nation. Um, and it was considered amazing, best leader of Israel. But however, he still failed. Um, he still cheated on his wife. He still murdered his best friend to cover up uh, the pregnancy of his wife that he slept with, of his friend's wife that he slept with. You know, I see this and I'm like, holy crap. Like there's so much there. Uh, I think for me, things that I prayed for that I saw was like, God, I'm going to fail. Like I'm going to mess up, but I pray that I still have a radical faith like David did for you and the forgiveness that you've had on him that I could see that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so I, I think in rodeo, it was like, you know, not to get too preachy on a rodeo podcast. for You're you. good. But, yeah, you're good. But I think in rodeo, it was like, for me, I like God did things in my life that were just like unbelievable. I'll mute that for you guys. But just the, uh, like, I, I just can't explain how I saw God's hand in my life through the time that I was able to just spend um, praying through him, to him, mm-hmm. uh, asking for uh, guidance in what I was doing in rodeo. And so I, I think if somebody's, if somebody's open to the idea of looking back on their life and realizing how they've gotten where they are, it's not by chance, <laughs> by no means. It's not by anything of what, even what you think you've done. It's by complete design. I mean, look at the doors that open for you me Mm -hmm. getting clay trying like i had to go ask him (laughs) Mm -hmm. you know he said yes getting to buddy with a guy like that but even stumbling upon some of the horses i got or just being stuck in the middle of nowhere in you know in ogden utah and and me calling rin richard and a guy uh, jesse nash coming and fixing my truck like it's unbelievable Mm -hmm. uh, what happens in our lives that we just like take for granted and I think for me, I wanted to be able to enjoy the moments and see that. And I wanted to see God's hand in that. So one of the things that I prayed for was, was that, is that I would see God's design in my life um, through rodeo and through where I'm at, whatever that looked like um, at the time, so that my faith could grow uh, in such a way that I would only be able to understand how a relationship with Him. Did you grow past rodeo? Tell me about stepping away from the sport. How, how did that transition happen? Golly. That was a hard transition for me. I, it, it was hard in the fact that uh, I knew I was going to miss something. Like I, honestly, I had days, uh, this sounds crazy. I had days where I was emotional about it. Like I would, I was like, dang it, you know? Mm-hmm. And then I, and there were days that, uh, where I was excited about what you know, I was going to do in the future. Uh, but I, it was, I was slowly transitioning out of it. I, I knew that I had other things that I was going to be doing in life. Um, I, I had accomplished everything that I wanted to do in rodeo. I had made the finals, won some majors, had fun, loved it. Um, that's what I wanted to do. So I knew, okay, my time here is, is, is done or I'm either going to make a career of this. And I, I made the decision that's done to be able to carry on what they're doing. Uh, Cause I love it. The purpose of what we're doing here at Premier Designs. Um, but the transition wasn't. Yeah. Easy. Can you tell me a little bit about what you're doing? Do yeah. You, yeah. Yeah. For well? sure. For sure. So yeah, the transition out of it was, I, I knew it was going to be hard. I started teaching lessons at, at, at National Rail for Supply mm-hmm. uh, in our world. Um, out there in Decatur, which was phenomenal. I love those people out there. It was an outstanding opportunity for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I started teaching in transition. I started finishing out school full-time. Full I was competing a little bit still at the time. I was working with like Trey Johnson, and um, Jake Smith, uh, mm-hmm. some of the guys out there. And I um, was loving it. You know, had a blast doing it. But I just kind of knew ultimately down deep that I was like, hey, I'm going to get out of the sport. And that, uh, there's other things that are there in my life that I need to pursue. Um, so I started pursuing working at premier designs and the first day uh, i remember or i'm sorry i remember the last day that i had before the first day at work inside of premier designs and i remember my my farrier was there dean jameson and i looked over at him and we're shooting some horses and i'm like bro uh this is my last full day at in rodeo and i remember telling him man i'm gonna miss so much about this it's kind of an emotional thinking about it right now a little bit hmm. um just because I was looking at my horses, I was like, golly, you know, what am I going to do with this? How do I handle this? What I'm, I'm not going to be out here all the time. And, uh, and he's a solid dude. And we talked for about an hour about it. And it's funny. You miss even the little things, you know, like you miss, <laughs> this is stupid. Uh, but I miss like my, hand, I, 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 I still rope a little bit for fun on the ground and stuff, but like I missed, I told him, it was like, I'm going to lose calluses on my hands that we have from roping. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to be behind a desk, like straight up. Mm-hmm. And, and it's like, that's the little stuff I'm going to miss. I'm going to miss, you know, catching my horses in, in the pen, things like that all the time. Uh, but, you know, the transition of where I'm at now, it was hard, but uh, I love what I'm going to do now. 
And what kinda, sparked it? What sparked the transition? Oh gosh. Uh, I think I always knew, like even before I started rodeo, I knew I wanted to be in premier designs. Mm-hmm. Um, I love rodeo. I love what I got to do there, but I have always looked at rodeo as a, as a stepping stone to what God has for me in the future. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I think when I look at um, what I'm doing now, the spark was like this innate desire to mm-hmm. impact people through this company that's, that's been used so much to enrich people's lives in the same way for you know 30 years and to continue that legacy is what I want to do. So I think it was just a perspective of what I wanted to really ultimately do. Yeah. And it's part of the family business, right? Premier Designs yeah. is, is the family business. Yeah. 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 So it, you know, we say it's, it's, it's a, it, it was founded by my grandparents, um, but it was not, uh, it's not intended to be a family business by no means. Gotcha. Uh, yeah. So uh, that's kind of the perspective of it for sure. Mm-hmm. Hey everybody, this episode is brought to you by our friends at the Lazy E Arena and the Cinch Timed Event Championship. This is a Cowboys Ironman event, 25 head of cattle, over five rounds. It is going to be a blast. I hope to see you there this year, March 8th through the 10th. If you go to lazyetec.com, you can get your tickets. Looking forward to seeing you there. So what are you doing these days? I How do you am, spend your days? <laughs> <laughs> gosh. Uh, except for this morning because I was kind of a little sick. But every morning I wake up at 6 o'clock, I'm usually I'm in the office by 9. Uh, and I'm from 9 to whenever it works done for the day, I'm, uh, which is anywhere from you know, 6 to 7 on average probably. Mm-hmm. Uh, I am in marketing. I'm in supply chain. Uh, a lot for what we're doing inside of uh, Premium Designs, which is a direct sales jewelry company. So mm-hmm. uh, I'm supply chain for importing our product, which I'm not head of that, but I'm learning a lot about that, but I'm more so involved with the marketing side. Uh, I do a lot of uh, work with our people in the field, which we have thousands of people inside the the field that I get to work with every day. So there's a lot of dynamics in that. And and it's a fun job. I absolutely love it. So it looks like you have a blast. You are, (laughs) you're traveling a lot too. It looks like, and you you know, in retrospective rodeo, not at all. (laughs) (laughs) Gotcha. Gotcha. And getting married? Oh my gosh. Yes. <laughs> That's I mean, awesome. It's funny what you can do when you slow down and aren't rodeoing and how relationships can blossom. <laughs> <laughs> yes, for sure. Uh, it's really fun. Um, her name's Kristen Anderson. She's amazing. She is the love of my life. I absolutely adore this girl. We get married in 72 days, which is crazy. <gasps> how uh, involved have you been in the planning? Uh, so I did a, I planned the proposal. I did all these things. And when I proposed, I told her I'm ready to get married tomorrow. <laughs> and I said, uh, jokingly said, I was like, you've been planning this your whole life. Like we should be ready to go. Right. And you know, obviously she looks at me like, shut up, Drew. <laughs> but I need to do the grunt work for her. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm, I, I was thinking about this morning. I was like, I'm like, I either, I love planning events. I plan parties all the time. I host things all the time and I love it. Uh, and I look at this now and I'm like, gosh, it's the most stressful thing in the world. Like, why is planning an event <laughs> for one thing? So stressful. It's ridiculous. Um, so I've been involved, uh, but I don't want to say I've been involved a lot. She's really the captain. I, I tell her I'm her direct report for whatever she needs. <laughs> so I, I'm just trying to follow her need uh, on that and try to serve her well on that. And so I, I'm involved, but not really that much. So that, That's good. That's yeah. good. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Are you getting married in the Dallas area? Yeah. So yeah, we're getting married in Dallas. She's from Florida originally. Oh, okay. So funny story about her. Funny story about all this, really. I, you know, rodeo cowboy from Dallas, Texas and been in the dirt growing up. And, and you know, it's no big deal for me to be around large animals or any of that at all. She grew up in Cocoa Beach, Florida, which is a surf town. Uh-huh. Uh, the east side of Florida, small surf town, little tourist town. Now her dad was a surfer growing up. Um, so totally different, <laughs> totally different <laughs> background, like beach life, surfing. And then I'm in, you know, no, no beach anywhere to be seen, you know, cowboying for 10 years of my life. And so we come together through church and it's just kind of funny to kind of see the backgrounds of that. So anyway, side very, note. Very cool. That's awesome. No, I'm so yeah. happy for you. I watch you on all of your social channels. That sounds creepy that I don't mean it that way. I just always follow you. I, <laughs> well, watch, I, you. I watch you too on your social channels. I watch channels you. Too, so. I watch you on your social channels. No, <laughs> yeah. I, I just got done watching that Netflix show you and it's about a stalker that like stalks anyways. And so that, that was way too real for me to say that right now, but no, I follow yeah. your social channels and it sounds, it looks like you're having such fun and I am yeah. so excited 
excited for everything you've done post rodeo life. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I'm excited. Are we going to see you at any like U.S. ropings? Like, are you going to get oh your number gosh. lowered and heal somewhere? Like, yeah. are you going to be one of those guys? Like, any desire to to jackpot even? There is a lot of desire to jackpot. Like, a yeah, ton of it. I'm not even kidding. Like, I get, I, I, I still get. So, as far as local jackpots go, like North mm-hmm. Texas and stuff, um, I'm on a text message thread of like multiple text, you know, text message campaigns where I'll get advertisements for opens every other week or every week. And I thought about getting off of that early on, like maybe a year and a half ago. I was like, no, I'm not leaving that. Like I want to still have that, that bug in me. I want to see what's going on. You know, Mm -hmm. Uh, truthfully speaking, like it wouldn't, uh, I just, I'm confident. And when you do something well and you're just, I could come back to heading right now and I feel like I'd still be a nine, you know, heading, um, Mm -hmm. months, but healing, (laughs) <laughs> Healing. On the other hand, um, I I feel like my number is is too high as it was even when I was roping full time, and so I was I was a seven healer. Uh-huh. I, you can ask every, just ask Driggers. He'll make fun <laughs> or Jade. Ask any of those guys. They'll all mock my healing. And Chad. The, oh, you know what? The day before I won the BFI, the day before I won the BFI, mm-hmm. I was roping at Jade's house in Fallon with Chad Masters, and I told him I go I want to heal, and just for fun. Mm-hmm. And so he turned me five steers on some random hill horse. I don't even know what I was riding. And I told him, I go, if I rope two feet one time, I'm going to win the fights tomorrow. And I rope two <laughs> feet on the third steer out of five steers. I'm not even kidding. <laughs> and I rope two feet twice, maybe, I think. And I told him, I was like, that's a sign. I'm going to win the fights tomorrow. <laughs> and, joke, and we went and won the fights. So that's awesome. <laughs> my healing's got some good luck in there somewhere. But so there's a chance we might see you. <laughs> there is a chance I come back. I've called a few guys around North Texas, and I told them, hey, let's enter Northside over at Billy Bobson but you got to bring me a horse. <laughs> so <laughs> and I've thought about it a few times. We'll, we'll see. I still got the bug. Good. Very cool. Well, with that said, maybe we will see you with the wildfire here in a couple of weeks. I oh think. Oh my but. gosh. What are they doing for that nowadays? Like it's, no in Hamilton. it's, it's in, in Hamilton. It's in Hamilton. Yes. Is and there it's an open open. Uh huh. Yeah. There's a, there's, I think this year I was just briefly looking at the schedule. There's like two open ropings, I'll, maybe a six year or something. I, Drew, sorry, Drew and Lane, the guys that run the wildfire are going to kiss me for not having their program memorized. But there are, I should actually look in the team roping journal because I'm pretty sure the ad's in there. Um, but they have an open, they have all kinds of stuff. They have a rope like a girl breakaway because the breakaway is huge these days. Yeah. Wow. While you've been gone, the breakaway has just exploded in your absence. Okay. Well, I've been watching the, like the WCRA and all that mm-hmm. stuff. It's unbelievable. I mean, um, just fun to watch it this past week and or two weeks ago when it was or something in Chicago. Yeah. Yeah. You were kind of involved somehow in the ERA a little bit. You were a supporter. I was, um, a, yeah, a huge supporter of that. Like I'm yeah. a huge supporter for growing the sport of rodeo. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not surprised you mentioned the WCRA for sure. I'm glad you're yeah. still watching. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we actually had Bobby on the podcast just this past week. Was or talking about the kind of the things that they learned in Chicago and all the all the changes that they're going to make for the next time around. So, oh, cool! I have to listen to that one. Yeah, it's on the he's, short score. He's invited to my wedding. He's supposed to be there. Who's your best man? Is there? My, is it, my it's not. It's my brother. My brother's my best brother. man. Yeah. So I don't. I don't think there's. There's. Uh, yeah. So not a lot of rodeo presence in your wedding sadly not no. um in all sincerity i was like uh, i wanted to have a lot of people i really did and i was mm-hmm. gonna invite rodeo guys and stuff um but i invited a few pretty influential guys in my life in rodeo bobby mope and one of them trey johnson and, and buddy mm-hmm. but no i actually was seriously bummed about that i was mm-hmm. looking at the guest list and i was like my gosh i'm really sad that you know not being able to invite more guys because we have to cap it and so i was like sure. oh, crap. So that's just part of it. It is a it is. bummer, but there'll be there'll be other rodeo guys that aren't. Uh, there are other guys in the Western industry that aren't pro rodeo guys that'll be there. Yeah. So there'll be quite a bit, but not you know rope partners or anything like that necessarily. So very cool. Well, thank you so much, Drew. This was fun. I I love it because it's a little different than what we've done lately on this podcast. So yeah, I appreciate your time. Absolutely. Well, thanks, Chelsea. I, I really Thank appreciate you. bringing back on it. Any, anything I can get involved and have that little bug and the little high of rodeo <laughs> is, is fun for me. So I love it. I love using your, you for stuff, Drew. I appreciate it. Have a good one. Absolutely. I'll talk to you later. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. All right, everyone. Thanks for your time. Thanks for listening to our conversation with Drew today. It really means a lot that you all stop by. It would mean even more if you left us a review on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, or wherever you happen to be listening to your podcast. Thank you.